Callie Mathias is the Link Data Community Outreach Librarian at Stanford Libraries, and Jeremy Nelson is a software engineer at Stanford Libraries. His main research focus is on improving workflows in open source library and bibliographic systems like Folio and Synopia using large language models and other machine learning techniques. Okay, it's all yours. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I am Callie. Uh, I am with Jeremy here. We are presenting Graph Explorer, a browser-based tool for querying Synopia RDF. If you are new to LD4 and new to Synopia, I thought I'd start by giving a bit of background. Um, so Synopia is an open source linked data cataloging tool. Um, it is optimized for BibFrame, though you can create any kind of linked data. Synopia was a project of the LD4P grants, which was generously funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And Synopia, the name, comes from a reddish brown pigment that is used to sketch out a fresco widely used in the medieval and Renaissance periods and nods to Synopia's origin story as an idea or a first pass at what a linked data cataloging editor could look like. Um, so some snapshot stats for you. There are 2,719 user accounts across the three Synopia environments as of a few days ago. Uh, there are some duplicates in this number. So a lot of people create accounts in production, stage and development, which are the three Synopia environments. Um, production is made generally for more finished data. The idea there was to keep it for a bit longer than um, the stage data, which we actually don't refresh or remove hardly ever, but that is more of a testing ground, more of an experimental space. Um, and then our third environment development was generally used for uh, developers to test out new features before pushing them into stage and production. It is also currently being used by the Ex Libris linked open data focus group. There are 46 different institutions registered in stage. So if you join Synopia and your institution has a group, I will assign you to that group as well as our kind of catch all other group. Um, so 46 official institutions there. We have 35 institutions in production. 41% of users have both a production and a stage account. Uh, Synopia was first released in 2019, and there are an incredible 48 countries represented in our Synopia user base. So what is Graph Explorer? Um, Graph Explorer is a proof of concept for loading Synopia RDF data in a browser-based environment, and it allows you to query that data. So we'll show you this in a few moments, but you can select groups, or paste a URI to investigate an individual resource. Um, and then you can query that returned RDF using Sparkle. You can also download these results as a CSV file. And I have the link to Graph Explorer included in this slide and in our very last slide. So why did we build it? Um, so there have been community requests over the years to enhance the discovery of Synopia data. So how can I see what's in Synopia? How can I use it? Um, and folks wanting to query that data uh, being our point number two here. So we're trying to provide more ways to work with the Synopia data and to see it. Um, and the third reason being that it is a natural next step for Synopia tooling and services. Um, many of you may be familiar with the Wikidata query service, um, which is a Sparkle query service that allows you to investigate data in Wikidata. So this is sort of something uh, similar to that, except we're using Sparkle and not little fields you click on. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy, who will speak about um, designing the Graph Explorer. Yeah. So the design of the Graph Explorer is uh, based on the sort of user interface and CSS of the Snopey editor. Uh, so we were able to leverage all that work that was done um, in the development of, of Snopia. Uh, there were a couple of things that uh, we were constrained with. One is that we really didn't have de dedicated server space or even a budget to do that. So uh, the, the Graph Explorer itself is a static website. So uh, it is hosted through GitHub pages, uh, which allows you to 
publish uh, web pages or website uh, through a, a, a GitHub repository. Um, around uh, the same time I were I was the way I was getting some of these requests a couple of years ago, I was a I was attending a PyCon um, in Salt Lake City. And uh, Anaconda, the the company that's sort of well known in terms of scientific compute computing, uh, released a new new project called uh, PyScript, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the, uh, a top or high level uh, summary of PyScript is that it really allows you to run Python within your web browser through uh, WebAssembly, and so uh, this. Uh, really sort of spurred the development and the design of the Graph Explorer because now we could leverage all the rich RDF tooling that's in Python and and then instead of needing to run a server-side uh, application, we can run that within your web browser. So uh, sort of the, the development of this, and I've sort of already alluded to it, uh, we're, we didn't... Uh, develop any sort of new user interface elements or design. We really sort of cur uh, copied the existing Sinopia editor, uh, which is which is uses Bootstrap as sort of its core uh, UI and CSS framework. So we just use that as well in the Graph Explorer. Uh, again, the core logic and really uh, the, man the manipulation and um, <clears throat> querying and sort of generating the the CSS is all uh, done through PyScript, uh, which which again runs as within uh, WebAssembly. A uh, WebAssembly uh, is a, a way to run uh, code that's close to native speed within your web browser. So it's sort of like a sandbox, um, and you're not restricted to just like JavaScript to run. So PyScript runs within the, that WebAssembly environment. Uh, uh, PyScript also allows you to use uh, a number of different Python packages that some of you may be familiar with. Most notably, we in the Graph Explorer, we're using Pandas uh, that's, that's running within your web browser to do the uh, sort of CSS-based functionality that, that, uh, that, that exists in the Graph Explorer. Uh, RDF data is still hosted and is still accessible uh, that that you 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 may have created or you, or edited within the editor, and we're just using the Snopia API to retrieve that RDF dynamically and loading it within your your web browser, and then from there, um, it, we create an RDF graph, and then that allows you to uh, run your Sparkle queries and, and do what you like to do within within your your local. Uh, web browser. Um, there are a, a couple of limitations. Uh, the The size of the graph is really limited to your uh, uh, web browser, or your computer's memory. Uh, right now, Snopia doesn't have a huge uh, amount of uh, native RDF data, so uh, you can pr pretty much load most environments uh, within your web browser. But if for whatever reason you're constrained in your memory, you might have some issues loading the some of the larger uh, groups. Uh, PyScript and the Graph Explorer also can uh, leverage JavaScript for additional functionality. Uh, there is, uh, PyScript provides you a way to sort of bridge to use all the underlying JavaScript uh, libraries that exist in your web browser. So that's that's really helpful. And we're actually doing that when we're doing the retrieval of the RDF. So how are we using the Graph Explorer? So uh, I thought I'd go over some of our current uses and specific use cases for um, this new tool. So we have been using it in mapping Synopia, PCC, BibFrame, work and instance template data to Folio inventory instance. And I'll show you some of these queries in the demo portion. Um, Sparkle is used to surface this data. And the same Sparkle queries are used in the Folio ILS middleware to locate that data in Synopia for use in creating a new uh, Folio instance record. Um, so it is playing a, a real part in our workflows. 
And it's also just a great tool, I think, for practicing Sparkle with real library data. So we're not working with Wikidata or DBpedia. Um, we're working with data created by catalogers in a cataloging tool environment, which I think is really exciting. Um, and practicing some what I'm calling experimental querying, it all has hopes in that it is useful to us. But um, so I started initially playing around and asking questions like, which resources exist in a particular group in a particular language? How many, insert uh, your a language resources exist in this particular Synopia environment? Can I filter resources by title and that title's language code? and which resources were created by a particular cataloger. So some of these things you can do in the Synopia editor um, itself, but some are a little bit harder to do within it um, or, or not possible to surface some of the data this way. Um, so as we go through the demo, um, I would be curious to know what kind of queries you would like to see and what questions you would ask of Synopia. So with that, I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen so I can reorient, uh, pull up the Graph Explorer and get my queries handy. Okay. I think the easiest way to do this would be to share my whole screen. Okay, so you should be seeing the Graph Explorer. I'm going to go ahead and just uh, kind of refresh it. So you can see it's setting up the environment. And when I land on um, the Graph Explorer page, it looks a lot like Synopia, as, as Jeremy mentioned. Um, so it has a very similar design. It's prompting me to load RDF environments and groups. So I can select from development stage or production. And when I click one of these environments, the groups will populate here. I don't have uh, an individual resource to demo today, but I wanted to point out this box here. So if I had a Synopia URI for a particular resource, I would paste it in this box um, and it would function in a very similar way that, to what I'm going to show you today. Um, the graph summary page, once an environment is loaded, will show you how many, uh, give you some, an, a, basically a summary, uh, an overview of the data that you have just um, asked Synopia to load, and then a area to query, which is titled Sparkle here. So I am going to pull up some queries. Uh, I wanted to start with the production environment and all groups and i'm going to click on build graph so just to repeat i clicked on production and i selected all groups so this will encompass this entire list here of institutions and when i was referencing the institution groups earlier this is what i was referring to so you can see all of these groups here um, have contacted us and said we would like our own institution group um, and if you would like an institution group you can let me know um, and we can set that up for you so I'm going to click on build graph and it's going to be thinking here and building that graph for me. And while it does that, I'm going to just copy and paste a query I wrote here. That is going to basically be looking at uh, languages. I should also mention that the size of the data that you are grabbing will impact the time it takes to build. So since I am pulling all of the production data, it does take a minute. Um, there are times when it's been working here that I'm able to query, but I like to generally wait until I see it stop. Um, if you pull one institution group with a small set of data, it it may you know pull be able to get it uh, very quickly. Um, and that actually, is pretty good. So um, this query is basically looking for um, Korean language titles. Um, so I'm looking for the subject, which is going to be uh, the Synopia 
resource URI, main title, the subtitle, and the uh, statement of responsibility for languages uh, for Korean titles. So you can see super quick, um, the subject is my resource uh, URI. It's pulling the main title, subtitle, and responsibility. I have seven, um, seven Korean titles here. You could play around and change this. So if I choose English, and these are just language tags um, that are part of the Synopia uh, editor and templates uh, and catalogers select this. And in many cases, it's defaulted to English and they it doesn't change, but you are able to change it if needed. And you can start to see like uh, some of, it's fun to surface some of the data and see what is there across all resources. Um, and make some assumptions or uh, answer some questions about what the data quality looks like, where mistakes might be happening, where things are working really well. Um, so that's one example. I'm going to go back to load RDF. And I'm actually going to just restart the environment um, because it's something I like to do. And I'm gonna move on to stage. So I spend a lot of time looking at the PCC data in the stage environment, probably more than any other group. And I'm going to click build graph. And these are some of the queries that I mentioned earlier um, that are being used in the folio mapping. Um, so we're gonna start with title. I thought I would show you the graph summary for this group. So um, it will tell you the total number of triples. So in this case, we have 45,000 triples in the PCC stage group. Uh, 10,000 subjects, how many predicates, how many objects. And you can download this here, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so for our first query, we're gonna do the same thing, except I'm not uh, filtering by a language. I'm just going to ask it to retrieve um, the main title, subtitle, and responsibility. So this query together is, is taking this data from the instance and is going to um, use it in the title field in Folio. Um, so we're combining a few different of the uh, template properties here for this query. Um, I can also show you one for ISBN. Oops, that was the same thing, a moment. So again, we have the subject URI. I can pull all the ISBNs that are in the PCC stage data. And I thought we could look at classification number and item number. So this again would map to the ISBN field in Folio. And if we wanted to pull a classification number and item number, we could do that as well. Um, and I've also queried here the classification type. So it's, we can basically say this is an LC classification number and not just any old kind. Um, so I'm gonna go back to load RDF and I wanna restart it. You don't have to do this. I just do it because I'm paranoid. <laughs> and um, we're gonna switch to development. So this is where um, a lot of great data lives because of the XLibris Link Data Focus Group members. Um, and thank you to them for, for adding more data to Synopia to work with. And I'm going to choose all, and I'm gonna build this graph. And this is sort of a, another real life use case where as some of you or many of you know, um, BibFrame continues to mature and develop. And as properties change, there are sometimes edits that need to be made to the data in Synopia. The templates are also RDF based. So if a property goes through a change, like um, something moves from BFLC to the main bib frame ontology, or the, <clears throat> the verbiage, the word changes slightly or significantly, um, for the templates to load properly and as expected um, for anything made in the past and things going forward, that data needs to be updated. So generally we will go and update the template by hand and we're looking for ways to kind of make this a little bit um, less cumbersome 
and more um, automated so that there, there's a little more regularity. Um, so this query is basically uh, going to surface all of the um, data that's using BFLC relation ship <laughs> relationship. Um, and I, I actually should point out here that the namespaces that are provided by default generally work um, for everything. So if you find like an error as you're querying, just make sure that you have all the namespaces you need there. Um, you can add them uh, if one is is missing. So um, here I'm looking for, again, my Snopee URI, the, the related title and the relation label. So um, these are related titles, relation label. And I realized, oh, this is really great. I can see, you know, what properties are being used or what um, what relationship terms are being used, but this won't actually help us change the property. So I actually need to change what I'm querying from uh, the value to the actual properties. So um, I'm going to show you what that looks like here. So th these are just for instances. These properties also appear in works. So I would need to run two different queries, but you can see basically this Sinopia URI is, it has this subject in it. So in theory, um, we could go find them and update them if we needed to. Um, and that's all I have to share on the user side. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass this back to Jeremy, who's gonna talk a little bit about uh, developer stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let me share my screen here. So uh, what I'm going to be doing now is showing you a little bit of how things are implemented and some of the additional tooling that's available. Uh, so if you go to the uh, GitHub repository for the Graph Explorer, <clears throat> you can actually it's uh, you can actually see it's uh, not a, not very complicated in how it's laid out. Uh, the index.html file, this is the static uh, main page that you see when you load it, load it up. And I just wanted to show you a couple of things here. Um, one, um, when I talked about some of the, the packages that are loaded, you can see here that we're loading uh, sort of in this pi config is where we're loading uh, those external uh, packages in Python to use. So we're loading pandas, Markdown, uh, Jinja2, which is a, a templating language. And then uh, this is one uh, sort of a custom uh, a package for the RDF lib. And this is the latest version. Then uh, some of the internal code so what's really nice about PyScript is that you can load in actual Python uh, modules. And so everything you can see here um, that's actually uh, powering the functionality in, in Synopia or in the Synopia Graph Explorer here, uh, you can we can take a look at some, some of these Python scripts. And then here is sort of the uh, main uh, setup that does um, basically uh, prepping the environment so you can actually use it. Um, so to give you a little bit of a sense there, if we go into source, you can see here we have our Python scripts. So if you clicked on one of these, this looks pretty similar uh, to um, any sort of Python code that you that you may use. But again, that's really cool that you're running all this locally within your web browser. Um, so here I've went ahead and loaded up the um, PCC group from stage. And again, um, you can see here, we have uh, sort of the, the summary view, there's 45,036 triples and the subjects and predicates there. Um, uh, one thing, um, and Cal Callie mentioned this, you can download this graph in these various serialization formats. So you, Turtle, R XML RDF, JSON Link Data, or N3. So that can be helpful um, if you if you want to load up a group and then, or multiple groups, and then you could download that graph. Um, in the Sparkle, um, so I'm going to just do a, maybe a quick, so if I can do this off the cuff. Uh, subject, predicate, conduct, uh, uh, yeah, that was, that was smart for you to uh, have them all ready to go. 
so a very sort of your your very simple um base query here so basically just grabbing all the triples um okay so we can see yeah it's taken a long time because we're you know there's 45,000 triples there to, to display. But what I wanted to show you is that you can download this uh, uh, result set as a CSV or JSON. So, um, you know, if, if you want to uh, do some experiments or, you know, r run a query against your Synopia data and then download the CSV to import into something like Excel or, or another or uh, Tableau or something. Uh, th there's the functionality to, to allow you to do that. Uh, finally, what I want to show you is a, a additional, uh, really a perk, if you will, of using PyScript, and that PyScript allows you to actually have a Python REPL. So this is basically a, a live Python environment that you can dynamically uh, use to run uh, Python expressions against the basically the state of your uh, web browser. In this case, we have access to the currently loaded graph. So I'm going to go ahead and do that just to give you a sense of it. So from state import uh, Snopia graph. So Snopia graph is the current graph that you've loaded within, within the graph explorer. And then I can just do a quick uh, Snopia graph here just to see how many triples are available. And you can see that sort of uh, lines up with what we'd expect uh, with uh, the total triples. And in fact, we're using, uh, actually displaying the summary uh, tab that you saw uses uh, these, these properties of the Snopia RDF lib graph to do, um, to do stuff. So I could also um, you know, run direct queries here um, I, uh, let's see, let me, um, let's do this. Let's go, uh, subjects equals. And so I'll do a Python li list, uh, comprehension. So here, I'm just going to create a, a li Python list of all the subjects. No, oh, I didn't like that. Oh, and because. I uh, well, didn't, didn't make, okay, so now subjects, you can see there's that. And if I wanted to, let's say, grab the 67th subject, there you can see there's the, it's a, um, in this case, um, it's a blank node uh, for this particular resource. Um, one of the things that we, we are doing in the Graph Explorer is columnizing all the blank nodes. So basically, uh, creating a, a URL representation of the blank nodes. And that's to uh, allow us to um, better um, integrate and uh, support multiple uh, groups to be able to load into the same graph. Um, otherwise, you might have some collusion uh, with how, and on the Snopia API side in the, in the data store, uh, we don't scalamize the the blank nodes, so we just store sort of local reference to that particular graph. But if you're loading multiple resources, you need a way to distinguish uh, those blank nodes, and so that's that's why you you can see in this case the blank node is actually uh, uh, pinned at the end uh, with this uh, pound B forty seven, and so that's a, a that's a common technique to do that in in, in sort of these linked data. Um, applications. Um, so that that's some of the, the underlying things. And again, this is all available for you if you want to open this into your web browser and to play around. And um, I would say, too, if you find, um, uh, let's see here. Uh, so the underlying RDF graph, um, this is what's being loaded, the RDF lib. And so there's a lot of different functionality that I'm not going to show, but you could go and um, you know, change values locally within your graph. It's not going to propagate those changes back to the Synopia API. We haven't en enabled sort of that editing functionality, but it is um, you. You do have access to all these different cool, you know, function uh, functions and and classes that are available in the RDF lib. All right, and so I'm going to stop my share. 
Okay, so let me, whoops, pull up our slides. Okay, so I'm curious if you all have questions you would ask Sanopia what they might be. You can feel free to put them in the chat. Um, if they come to you later, you can always join the Sanopia channel um, in the LD4 space and add those later. I would love to see what kind of queries you would like. Um, if you also have questions about getting started with Sanopia, let's say you aren't quite at the point where you are ready to ask it questions, you want to just learn how to use it, um, I will be hosting another Creating Descriptions in Sanopia workshop um, sometime very soon. It's been on my mind all month <laughs> and last month, uh, especially circulating at conferences that uh, it would be great to have another session. Um, this one will be recorded. But um, if you do have questions about the data in Sanopia that you would like to use Sparkle for, but aren't really quite sure how to start with a query or would like me to take a stab at it, please feel free to let us know. Um, and our last slide here is just a, a group of links and resources. So the link to the Graph Explorer is here, as Jeremy just said, please feel free to test it out. Let us know um, what you think. If you have an idea for an enhancement, if you encounter an issue, if you have feedback, there is a GitHub page where you can submit an issue and open a, a ticket of sorts to let Jeremy and I know what you'd like to see or uh, if you have questions about using it. Again, you can also just use Slack. Um, you can use the Synopia Slack channel or you can message uh, me directly. Uh, there's links to all of the fun developer tools that Jeremy just mentioned. So PyScript, Radlib, uh, Radlib and the Pandas. And um, I have a link here for the Library Juice Academy Sparkle course, just because I was lucky enough to take it. If you have funds available at your institution and are looking for um, a very strong introduction to Sparkle, and uh, maybe you've used the Wikidata query service a bit, maybe you've tried querying in DBPD and other places, um, I just really recommend this. It was, it was really great. And the Sparkle documentation, if you are more of a do-it-yourselfer, is, is linked here. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see, or actually I'm gonna keep this up. I can check the chat. Um, I didn't see any questions, but feel free to ask now or I will turn it back to Kelly. <laughs> Great, yeah, thank you so much, Kelly and uh, Jeremy. Um, please either ask questions in the Slack and uh, we can copy in paste them here or ask them in the chat here or unmute yourself or raise your hand or whatever. Uh, so I guess I'll do the chat one really quickly. So uh, Bob is asking, can you go back to the slide with all the links? Yes. Hi, Bob. Th thank you. And also the slides are linked in the SCED if you'd like to download mm -hmm. them and you can just click on stuff from there too. We have one from Slack. Uh, can you share the queries you used in the demo? Sure. Um, I will upload them to Sked as soon as we're done here. Thank you for asking for them. Maybe that would be a cool thing to do is to add some sample queries <laughs> um, so that folks can play around if you haven't um, had a lot of experience with Sparkle but still want to try to return some data. If there's any more questions, go ahead. I actually have one. You you describe it as a proof of concept. Um, what do you think more you know needs to happen, or what what are the future plans? Are you looking at each other right now? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, well, the funny thing is, Kelly and I have talked about sort of wh where we go from here. Um, one thing uh, I think we're looking at doing is adding more of a uh, a graphical uh, presentation of of your graph. So creating more a diagram of of maybe the graph and the results you get back. 
Um, so that would be interesting. I sort of alluded to it uh, before, but um, there is some sort of like in the back of our minds, so how, how can we improve the Graph Explorer to allow more, more than just reading in your triples? It'd be sort of nice to be able to, you know, run a query uh, if you wanted to change a value be able to change that value and then using the Synopia API uh, up, update the graph using uh, using the API itself. So um, that's sort of what we've been thinking about, um, turning this more really into a, a graph-based uh, linked data environment. So um, a, a lot of linked data right now, I, unfortunately, I think some of the, our, our editors are, are still not really graphy <laughs> if you will and so this is this is our attempt to actually make what what would uh library data link data look like as in a graph environment as opposed to you know a, a basic form based i also think um i really am excited to kind of more formally introduce it here. We've talked about it in a few different presentations, like just giving people a little bit to chew on that we have this Graph Explorer tool and we're using it. Um, but I would love to hear what the community thinks when they start using it and get their feedback for improvements, um, whether it's using it in an actual workflow um, or, um, I don't know, just seeing basically the response and and continuing to socialize it. And I too would love to see a, a a graph representation. I think that would be really fun. Uh, Jesu Bacade says, uh, graphical will be very nice. I was thinking about the data science aspect when the developer version was being shown, especially in the Python environment. Um, I have another comment, which is that it's, in my experience, been really hard to um, visualize the graph. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what comes out of your work there. Um, there's another question uh, from Laura. What happens if Synopia uses scales, use scales way up and it's too much data for our computer's memory? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, that, that'll be a nice problem to have to start mm -hmm. with. Um, however, uh, I, there, there are ways that we could incrementally um, load a graph. Um, so as you... You know, you you may start with uh, an initial starting point within a, within like a for example a really large group that has hundreds of thousands of, of resources that would probably overwhelm your local uh, environment. There, we would probably do more of a incremental loading, and as you explore the graph, we would sort of dynamically load in the uh, RDF as as you're exploring it. Um, it so we wouldn't we wouldn't do what we're doing now, which we're able to get away with with loading the entire group's graph, for example. So, um, so I I, th I think there are there are some strategies to to to, to do that. Um, also, another, I mean, then if we wanted to load the entire graph and have it available for querying, uh, and it's a particularly large graph, then I think we're looking more of a server side application. So. Uh, th th this is, again, a really a way for us to actually get some of this functionality out there for people to experiment without needing to have a lot of the server infrastructure in place. 